time I looked at a camera from GoPro was back in January 2013 when I did a comparison between the new at the time GoPro HD Hero 3 White Edition and Sony's AS10. Those were the cheapest cameras in each manufacturer's ranges at the time. I didn't really rate the Hero 3 White. I thought the image quality was subpar, where I much preferred the Sony with its low light capabilities, stereo sound, and image stabilization. It also cost me quite a bit less. I got a good deal at the time, £115. The AS10 White Edition cost me close to £200. Now, if you read the comments under that video, you'd think I'd opened up a wormhole to Planet Stupid, where logic and irrationality don't exist, because the GoPro fanboys turned up in force to proclaim that the GoPros are always much better than every other camera. Camera. What I'd done, I'd reviewed the wrong GoPro apparently, the GoPro White. Everyone knows that's outdated technology, it's like a GoPro one that's been stuck in a new case. I was stupid for reviewing that one. I should have reviewed the HD Hero 3 Black Edition, the camera that costs three times the amount of the Sony. That would have been a fair fight apparently. They didn't seem to see where the logic had gone missing in that argument. I was reviewing two budget cameras and apparently I should review a budget camera versus a high-end camera. Then the high-end apparently would be better. They also thought it was okay for GoPro to re-release outdated, old, crappy technology, rebadged as a new camera for £200 and that was totally acceptable. So, anyway, there's no arguing with people like that. I think most of them have probably become recipients of Darwin Awards in the meantime, so hopefully this review will go a little bit better. This time I'm reviewing the new budget Hero camera, which is just called the GoPro Hero, versus an SJ4000. Most of this video features the Hero, though, with a few bits of SJ4000 thrown in. There's a full review of that elsewhere on my channel. Now, looking at the box, you can see here, those are the specs on it. 1080p, 35 megapixel. that's the waterproof uh, thingamajig there. Super view, I'll explain that later on. Auto low light, hopefully it's got better low light performance than the white, which was pretty terrible. Those are your resolution options there, look at those, that's what you've got. I'll show you that later on. Also down the bottom, notice the photo, 5 megapixel burst modes and time lapse. And then up here you can see the weights on the right hand side. It also says it needs a micro SD card up to 32 gigs, class 10. And also there's some software you can download. I'm not going to look into the software. I tend to just edit stuff in iMovie. Here's what's inside the box. I'll show you that in a little bit more detail later on. Uh, well, I'll say later on. It's about well, two seconds. There you go. That's it. That's everything inside the box. Let's just have a look. We've got two mounts. We've got one that's a curved mount. You can see that it curves in both directions. And then this is a flat mount for mounting on things that are curved or flat, obviously. A separate door for the back. Uh, this one's got holes in it. Two reasons. It lets in sound and it also vents the camera. Um, maybe there's another reason. Oh yeah, you can plug the power lead through it as well. That little thing there, I'll show you what that does. That stops the camera falling out of its uh, mount if you're particularly energetic. USB a to mini B cable. And we've got a few little instructions here. There's a quick getting started thing, which tells you to go on the internet and look at that. You can get download a full manual for this. We've also got this uh, important safety thing, which you're just going to ignore. And then a quick start guide, which is pretty much all you need to get up and running. But you can download that full manual off the internet as well, if you want. And in addition to that, we've got the obligatory stickers. So you can put those on all your things and go around being an unpaid advertisement for a company you've just given £100 to. And there's the camera itself. So it looks pretty much the same as every other GoPro camera at this stage. It's hard to know where they've cut the corners, but they have cut a few and I'll show you those later on. First thing though, it does fit to the GoPro mounts as you'd expect. It's a traditional mounting system they've used for years and it works really well. It holds things nice and firm. Now, of course, it is a boxy camera. It's not my kind of style. I don't really like the boxy ones, but if you do, then this GoPro will fit to all the other GoPro mounts you can get, chest harnesses and head mounts, all that kind of stuff. It just clips in at the bottom there. Now, opening it up, we've got this big clip across the top. We pop that open, it folds back using that metal hinge there to give you a nice opening so you can get right inside the door. Pop that down. We've got a bit of rubber in the back there that pushes against the back of the camera, presumably to stop it rattling around. Very easy to unclip one of those and uh, get the other back on there. Just clip that in place. It just closes up like that. Very nice and easy. And as I mentioned, that one gives you access to that USB port there. So you can charge it and record at the same time. And it also lets sound into the case, whereas the other one muffles the sound. So we'll just drop that down. Now, of course, the thing at the back here, we've got uh, those two parts on it. The micro SD card is just a spring-loaded slot. Just plops in there like that. Class 10, 
uh, is mentioned in the manual. I'm using a class 10, of course. And then we've got the USB port. But this is the thing that's different. The camera doesn't come out. That's where they've cut the corners. The camera and the case are all in one. You can't remove the camera from the case. So then that leaves a bit of an issue, as far as I'm concerned, because if you manage to break off those little bits at the bottom there, your entire camera is now going to be useless. You won't be able to mount it to anything. Or if you break that glass lens on the front there as well. Just something to bear in mind. I mean, that's why it's cheap. No complaints there, but just know what you're getting into, that if you are going to do something particularly strenuous, you think you might break the case, then you can't replace it. That little bit of rubber I mentioned before there, you can put that uh, on here. It attaches around the sort of screw thing there. And then the idea is you click the camera into its mount and then you push that in between that part there, which means those plastic legs can't be pushed together, which means the camera can't come out of its mount. Particularly useful if you're sort of bouncing around, I don't know, on water or something, you think you might hit those hinges and the camera might fall out. Just keeps it a bit uh, firmer inside there. Now, on the front we've got an LED and a button, button on the top. The front one is the power button. Uh, we'll switch it on and we'll just have a look at it. So just press it in there, just to tap and it comes on. You can see we've got the screen on there. It's not backlit, it's LCD. A little bit hard to see in some lights, as you can see, but I'll uh, try and get it just right so we can have a look at it. And then we can go through the menu options. This bit's going to take a little while. So if you get bored with this kind of stuff, I suggest you move forward in time a bit. But don't ask any questions about what was in here because it's your fault for missing it. Right, so you go through the different options there. Uh, so it starts off in the video mode, photo, burst, time lapse, settings and back to video again. Just go through them sequentially like that. So you can see on the screen that it says how many recordings I've made, how long I can fit on the current battery, photo again, that's how many photos I've taken and how many photos I can take on the current battery. Uh, burst mode takes uh, 10 photos in 2 seconds, 10 stills in 2 seconds. And then the time lapse mode takes a still, 5 megapixel still every half second. And then we've got settings, then we're back to video again. So if we want to start recording, uh, just press the button on the top. You can see the camera beeps, the light flashes on the front and it starts counting up in seconds on the screen. If we look at the back, we've also got a little LED on there so you can see that it's recording from the back. Nothing on the top though. So if we want to uh, stop recording, tap the top and there uh, just goes into standby. And tap it again, just start off. It's very quick, very responsive to start and stop. Now we're going to the photo mode. Obviously, you want to take a still, just tap it there. You see the number count up, 2183, 2184. Those are the number of stills I've taken. I've taken so many because I did a bit of time-lapse photography, which takes stills. Burst mode, look at 2185. I'm going to press the button. It should go up to 2195 after two seconds. There you go. So that's uh, 10 stills in two seconds. Five megapixel stills. Quite useful to take burst mode photos because you've got a good chance of getting a good one out of the middle of them, but it means you do take a lot of photos, but they don't take up too much space. Time lapse mode, only got one way of doing this. Five megapixel still every half second. You can't adjust those intervals or the still size. It's, that's just what it's doing. You can see it counting up there, 2210 and then 2220. It, it's just uh, stills that it does. Then it's up to you if you want to assemble those into a time lapse video. It doesn't make video, it just makes stills and you have to assemble them. Right, let's have a look at some of these settings now. So first off, resolution, 1080p 30. And we've got a choice of 1080p 30, 720p S60 and 720p 60. 720p S60 is like a super wide mode, which is a little bit weird. Uh, I'll show you some examples of that later on. So those are your three options there. Uh, true 60 frames per second as well, not some sort of artificial one. Uh, I say that because the SJ4000 doesn't really do 60 frames a second. You can adjust where your spot meter is, uh, whether you want it on or off. Upside down, I did mount the camera upside down in my car, so it's useful to have this flip option because you can mount it upside down and the video's the right way up. Quick capture, on or off. I'll show you what that does uh, later on, but it relates to these uh, things on the back of the camera. I'll just show you them now. It mentions it at the bottom here. You can do a short press shutter or time lapse is a long press shutter. I'll show you that later on. Uh, it just enables you to get the camera on quickly and start recording without having to turn it on first. Now, NTSC or PAL, you've got a choice. In NTSC, it's 30 frames or 60 frames a second for the two modes. If we go into the PAL mode, you can see we, it turns into 50 frames a second for the 720p modes and 25 frames a second for 1080p. It helps people in PAL territories merge the video in with their other video that they've recorded in other cameras. LEDs, you can choose to have them both on, both off, front on or rear on. 
and then the beeps you can have the volume of those either high medium or off it's quite good the loud beep because you need something like that to hear it through perhaps a motorcycle helmet so i do tend to leave that on that's where you adjust the date and time there is no time stamp on these videos it's just for the file uh, names it's the times and dates on those and then you can delete the last thing you recorded or all which is effectively is formatting you're always best to format the card in the camera when you first start off so that you get it all set up right now what you see now is what you get uh, it's not rather obvious but people do tend to ask does it do this does it do that no it doesn't have looping recycling wi-fi gps timestamp auto start stop motion detection whatever you think of it doesn't have it it only has the things that i showed you then the files are mp4s they're avc codec bit rates 1080p 30 and 720p 60 seem to be the same 15.1 megabits a second the camera records files in two gigabyte chunks which are 17 minutes and 35 seconds long battery life is really good two hours 53 minutes in my test and that was in the 1080p 30 mode now one thing i predict people are bound to ask can you plug an external microphone into this camera using the gopro accessory the answer is no not on this occasion if you look on the gopro website they have a list of the accessories that are compatible with this camera and it seems like pretty much none of the electronic ones are things like the lcd backpack just physical things now I'm going to show you some sample clips. Usual disclaimer applies. Sometimes YouTube can negatively affect the quality of these. And that is the reason I put downloadable samples available on my blog so you can download them to your own computer and see the true quality. Hopefully YouTube hasn't messed these up too much though. And we'll have a look at them now. Now, during the course of showing you these clips, I'm going to jump back and forth between the GoPro and the SJ4000 camera so that you can get a bit of an idea about the quality difference between the two models. If you want to see the full review of the SJ4000 where I go into all its features and things, there's a link to that in the video description. We're just looking at video quality difference here. So first off, this is the GoPro. Notice the field of view and the brightness and things. Now, this is the SJ4000. It's a slightly narrower field of view um, it's a bit more cropped in towards the middle, but it's still a very wide angle lens. It's just the GoPro is even wider. But notice how much darker it is, especially at the bottom there where there's these Starbucks. It's quite dark at the bottom left. Taking a freeze frame out of the video so we can look at it in a bit more detail. That's the GoPro. Um, and then that is the SJ4000. There's a couple of differences there, as well as the darker uh, uh, brightness on the SJ4000 there's one other important difference if we look at this and then zoom in on that side in the middle on the GoPro look at the text on there look how soft that text is and then we go across the SJ4000 noticeably sharper so the SJ4000 has sharper video than the GoPro but it also has darker video than the GoPro so you've got to decide what's more important to you getting the brightness right or having the sharpest possible image now, if we go to 720p60, this is something the SJ4000 can't do. The GoPro has a proper 60 frames a second mode in 720p, whereas the SJ4000 just does 30 frames a second and shows each twice. Now, let's move across to this weird uh, super view mode in 720p60, because I want to show you what that does to the image. So just have a look at that. And now, wow, what's happened there? The super view mode has a a wider angle of view and it shows more of the top and bottom of the image but then squashes it down into a 69 ratio um, video it, it basically looks like what happens when you get your tele set in the wrong mode and you've got the uh, wide angle showing on a normal tv show or vice versa it's not a pleasant view at all this is what a still looks like five megapixel still taken in burst mode uh, 5 megapixel stills look quite nice, 4-3 ratio, but a very wide angle lens of course, so not too much use trying to take photos with this camera, but at least it does them at a, a decent quality. Back to the GoPro again, looking outside, this is a good shot because you've got lots in view here, as you can see, all the way across, up and down. Check the difference in colours as well, the colours on the GoPro tend to be more uh, towards the yellow end of the spectrum whereas on the SJ4000 things go sort of bluer so you got like warm on the GoPro and cold on the SJ4000 but again noticeably sharper on the SJ4000. Now for my final indoor test I'm inside Manchester's Printworks and we're going to check out the low light capabilities of both cameras. So this is the GoPro first of all bringing in the SJ4000 from the right hand side you can see the difference in the sharpness perhaps between the two there but as I pan towards the left, you can see that the GoPro definitely has the advantage when it comes to brightness of the image. 
Now one thing that neither of these cameras have is any kind of built-in image stabilization but it's not as important in a camera with a big wide angle lens. You're looking at the GoPro now and I'm walking along holding the camera in front of me and it doesn't look bad at all because it's got such a wide angle lens, such a large field of view. Any kind of vibrations are dampened down by that view and you don't tend to notice them the same as you would with a normal lensed camera. Now if we bring in the SJ4000 from the right hand side here, you'll see that that image there is much too dark when you compare it to the GoPro. The GoPro is a kind of yellowy image perhaps and the SJ4000 is blue, but the GoPro is a much more pleasant image when you compare them side by side. Have you ever thought that you're walking in the opposite direction to everyone else? I always think that this is happening and actually I think this is video evidence that it's not just in my mind. One downside to a wide angle lens is barrel distortion, the way that these buildings curve in towards the centre of the lens. But whilst I'm doing this spinning around I want you to have a look at the exposure. This is the GoPro first of all, look how it copes with the difference in exposure between pointing at a building and pointing at the end of the road. Now look at the SJ4000, the same situation. It has these brightness pops where it's bright it goes dark and then as I move around towards the buildings it goes brighter again and then dark again. It's almost like someone's flipping a switch. It's not able to adjust brightness as smoothly as the GoPro. And also you get situations like this one here where the sun's at the top right behind those clouds and it really can't get the exposure right for this building at all. It's uh, just completely missing it. Whereas on the GoPro, that's what that looks like. This is the uh, camera in the same hand at the same time. And look how much better the GoPro copes with that situation. Now we'll also test out the sound quality for a minute or so on the GoPro. And it's a lot better than it was on the previous model I tested. try my patented tram test. Now the tram test involves watching a tram go past and then taking a freeze frame out of the image to see how diagonal the lines are which will give some kind of indication as to how slow the sensor is in each camera and also we'll see how sharp the freeze frame is that we can get out of both of them. So that's the tram shot with both the GoPro and the SJ4000. So let's have a look at a freeze frame of both of those images. So first up, GoPro, right? Okay, that's what that looks like. And then SJ4000, looks pretty similar to be honest. I don't know what I've proved there. All right, next test. The wide angle lens, you get quite a lot in shot. There's no screen on the back of the GoPro there's no way to see what you're shooting at but normally you point it in a direction and you tend to find you've got what you want in shot however it doesn't always work that way uh, I was trying to get this whole big wheel in shot I thought if I just point it somewhere up there it's going to be in shot it, obviously I missed the top of it which is where something like the screen on the back of the SJ4000 comes in handy now I'll just finish off this section by showing you some stills I took with the camera they're 5 megapixels, 4-3 ratio. One disadvantage of taking stills with an action camera with a big wide angle lens, everything tends to look a long way away. Unless you get really close to it, and then you get some strange fisheye effects. So it's perhaps not the kind of thing to use for taking photos at a wedding, but you can get some quite interesting shots with a camera like this. Oh, I nearly forgot the time-lapse mode. 
it takes still every half second. And then using your own time-lapse assembler software, you can stitch those stills together and make a video. This is what one of my videos looks like with those stills stitched together and shown at a frame rate of 20 frames per second. Of course, you can make it quicker or slower by adjusting the frame rate, but you can't adjust how frequent the camera takes those stills in time-lapse mode. It's one still every half second and that's your lot, but it still works pretty well. Right, now let's talk about power. The camera has a built-in, non-replaceable battery. It charges from the USB port. When it's fully charged, that red light on the front will go out. Now, because it charges from USB, that means, of course, that you can charge from a wall socket or from a computer or from a portable battery pack. And as you can see here, the camera is on and it's charging and it's now recording at the same time. So you could effectively power it from a big portable battery pack and have all day recording if you want. Now the camera doesn't have any dash cam type features, i.e. it won't automatically turn on and off when you apply or remove power. As you can see, I have to switch it off manually here. But you can make things a little bit simpler. If you want, enable the quick capture mode in the settings as I showed earlier on. And then to turn on the camera and start recording, you don't have to press the power button, just press the top shutter button. It turns the camera on and it automatically starts recording in video. And then when you want to turn the camera off and also of course stop recording, just one tap, it does both things together. Stops recording, switches the camera off. If you want to take time-lapse stills, hold down the top button for a couple of seconds, it jumps straight into that mode and again starts taking stills. And then if you want to switch it off, of course, just tap it once more and the camera will stop taking them and shut off. Now, other than that little test I did in the print works earlier on, we haven't really seen how the camera copes in low light. So I've stuck it in the car, taken it out for a drive, and you better see how it performs. I also do a little bit of talking to the microphone as well. So I think I'd best go over to me in the car. I've taken the camera out in the dark to demonstrate, of course, its low light capabilities. And also I'm talking to you now over the camera's own built-in microphone so you can hear a little bit more about how good the sound quality is. Uh, but also, while I'm here, I might as well mention the fact that a GoPro, or this GoPro in particular, wouldn't make for a good dash cam because it's missing two important dash cam features. The first one is a dash cam will automatically start recording when it receives power and stop recording when the power is disconnected. This camera doesn't have that feature. You have to turn on the camera and start recording yourself and then switch it off when you're finished. The second feature a dash cam has is the ability to rewrite over the memory card when it's full. So effectively, it kind of never gets full. It just keeps rewriting over and over the card. And this camera won't do that. When it gets to the end of the card, the card's full, it'll beep and the camera will turn off. Now that being said, there's a very clear difference between a dash cam and an action cam. A dash cam you'd use for your daily commute to and from work, going to the shops, very mundane type of things. The idea you're going to rewrite over the memory card unless something happens then you keep that footage. An action cam, you want to keep all the footage it records. You take it out to a track day or some kind of exciting event. You're going off-road, scrambling, whatever it is, and you want to keep all the footage and therefore that's why it doesn't rewrite over its own memory card. Now to do something a bit more interesting, I took both cameras, the SJ4000 and the GoPro, out on my motorcycle, although you won't see much of the footage from the SJ4000 because I didn't have it mounted very well. But this is the footage from the GoPro, I've got it on top of the brake fluid reservoir, it doesn't tend to get much in the way of vibration here on my bike and this footage looks really nice. I actually mounted it, you might have noticed there into a Sony action cam mount, which is what I've got on top of there, but I used a bit of an adapter to join the two things together, and it looks fine. The shots you're looking at at the moment are the 1080p 30 mode. I've pulled over to the side here and exchanged the door on the back of the camera for the one with the holes in it, so you can hear a little bit more sound from the engine and things. Uh, I'll be quiet in a second, but I just want to mention first that you might hear a bit of rattling, and I think that's something to do with my mounts. I don't think it's anything to do with the camera but I'll just let you have a listen to what the camera can hear with that door on it.
Now the next shot I'm going to show is in the 720p60 super wide mode. I'm going to have some 720p60 samples available to download, again link in the video description, but I'm showing you here at 30 frames a second just to give you an idea what it looks like when it's moving along. You can see we've still got this squashed effect on it, it just enables me to see more sky and more road which is not really that interesting to me. I don't think I'd like to use that mode at all. I much prefer the normal 720p60 so I'll jump across into that now to give you an idea what that looks like. So this is standard 720p60. Still see plenty in shot. I don't see really any need to use that other mode at all. Now you'll notice I haven't really shown you much from the SJ4000. That's because the way I've got it mounted on the uh, bike introduced a lot of vibration into the footage. I'll just show you a little bit of a clip now just to show you what the problem was. Look how wobbly the image is. I got it hanging down the camera below the other one trying to get a comparison shot as close as I could but I obviously hadn't got it mounted right. We've got a lot of wobble in here. It's nothing to do with the camera. It's not a problem on the camera this, at least I don't think it is because when I did the proper SJ4000 review a few weeks ago I took some footage with the camera in the same position that the GoPro has been on this journey. I'll just show you a bit of that and there you go. That looks an awful lot better than that wobbly stuff I've just been showing you. Again, if you want to see more about that, you'll have to see the separate review for that camera. But I did do a bit of a comparison. I want to show you this now. Forget the wobbliness of the SJ4000 because we know that's caused by the mount. But just look how it copes again with this scene. You can hardly make out what's going on on screen on the SJ4000, which is on the right. But the GoPro, even though we're heading uphill into a bright sky, you can still see what's happening on the road. And I think that is quite important. If something went on there, if somebody pulled in front of me, you'd better see it on the GoPro side, but you'd have trouble making out what was going on on the other. Now, in order to determine whether the SJ4000 doesn't cope as well with wobbles as the GoPro, I developed a bit of a test. Got my old reel-to-reel -reel here, unbalanced a wheel with some plasticine, put both cameras on the top, started them recording. There's a good wobble going on there, so we should be able to see what's happening with both cameras. And looking at the GoPro, first of all, that's what that one looks like. As you can see, there's a bit of vibration going on, uh, nothing too horrendous. Move across to the SJ4000, looks pretty similar, a little bit bulgier. If we put them side by side, you'll see that the SJ4000, whilst not being completely awful, definitely seems to be a little bit more wobbly. And I did swap the cameras around and tested them in both positions, and it was the same result both times. So only slightly, but a bit worse. Right, it's summary time, so let's have a look at the positives for both cameras. First off, the GoPro. It seems to have really good, solid build quality. It's very good at getting the exposure for the scene right and adjusting it throughout the course of the scene as well. It has a true 720p 60 frames per second mode. It's got a good long battery life and it seems to have less wobble when it gets into a situation where there's a lot of vibration. Now the SJ4000 has in its favour price. It's quite a bit cheaper than the GoPro, but if you add on the Wi-Fi option, it comes up to about the same price, but then of course you've also got the Wi-Fi. In addition to that, it's got a colour LCD screen on the back, which is very handy. It's got a sharper image. You can use it as a dash cam. If you break the case, you can replace it. And also you can swap out the battery on this one. Ultimately though, the decision is down to you. I've just presented the evidence for both cameras. You've got to decide which of those features are the most important ones for you. But I don't think you'll go too far wrong by buying either of these models. If you want to download some sample footage from the GoPro Hero, there's links in the video description. It'll take you over to techmoan.com. You'll also find links up there to my YouTube SJ4000 review. And of course, there's some Amazon links if you want to go ahead and buy one of these. But for the moment, as always, thanks for watching.